don't think we will ever see uh, face to face negotiations between Putin and Zelensky. But it's possible that in the next few months, the pressure will grow and we'll just have to see what happens. Zelensky has called for an emergency meeting of the United Nations Security Council in New York today after another barrage of Russian strikes on energy infrastructure. The latest attacks also caused blackouts in neighbouring Moldova as well as in towns and cities right across Ukraine. The mayor of Kyiv has already warned that the city is facing its worst winter since the Second World War. And on Twitter, President Zelensky has said the murder of civilians, the ruining of civilian infrastructure are acts of terror. Um, let's talk to Michael Binion, former foreign and diplomatic correspondent for The Times, who was based in Moscow and in Washington and all over the place. Michael, good to have you with us. Thanks. Um, just tell us first of all about the, the scale of these latest attacks on Ukraine. Well, it's part of a systematic pattern of trying to cripple Ukraine's energy infrastructure, hitting power stations, transmission lines, anything that would uh, knock out the electricity supply, uh, gas pipelines, heating, uh, the vital things that keep uh, a country going, uh, which is a, a, a tactic Russian clearly now using to try to freeze Ukraine into surrender with winter coming and temperatures dropping fast. And unfortunately, it does seem as though uh, these attacks have been pretty widespread and Ukraine is really suffering massive power shortages. And Moldova has also suffered blackouts, um, although it's, it wasn't actually hit by any of these attacks? No, well, I think Moldova's power network is probably linked to Ukraine's, and they probably exchange power across the border, as uh, many countries do, Britain and France, for example, they do that as well. So if Ukraine's network is knocked out or crippled, I think Moldova would suffer as well. Um, what about the United Nations? President Zelensky was calling earlier this evening for an emergency meeting of the Security Council. Has that actually taken place? I'm not sure, but even if it does take place, it's pretty meaningless because whatever uh, the accusations, uh, Russia, as a Security Council member, will veto any any sensible resolution. In other words, condemning you, uh, Moscow for what it's doing will never get adopted because Russia, as it has in almost everything uh, over Ukraine, it will simply issue its veto. So this is essentially just... President Zelensky trying to can keep the attention of the world uh, on the plight of his people. And these power cuts are really causing suffering, aren't they? Uh, knocking out uh, some medical facilities altogether, making life incredibly difficult for millions of civilians and leaving many vulnerable people at risk. Yes, exactly. I mean, it's a terrible situation. Uh, some places have got emergency generators. I think hospitals and one or two others have got generators that they've installed. And I think one of the things that the Western powers need to do urgently is to uh, ship in as many portable generators as possible for vital infrastructure, uh, hospitals and other places where people would clearly suffer if there was no electricity. Um, there are some, but uh, not enough, obviously. Uh, the European Parliament has taken a measure too. It's adopted a resolution uh, condemning Russia as a sponsor of terrorism because of these attacks, saying that those plus the uh, attacks on civilians and other uh, violations of international humanitarian or law, that amounts to uh, acts of terror. And the EU, well, the parliament at least, has condemned uh, Russia uh, by, by labelling it as such. Yeah, um, the European Parliament voted overwhelmingly for this resolution, um, saying that um, Putin's Russia was a state sponsor of terrorism. I mean, that does ramp up the pressure on the Kremlin and, and reinforce the sense of isolation, doesn't it? Yes. Uh, one wonders how much Putin will care about being isolated. He's pretty isolated already. Uh, and in fact, it doesn't have more than symbolic meaning because unlike the United States, the EU doesn't have a single unified list of state-sponsored uh, terrorist nations. So it can't just add a country to its list of, of sponsors of terrorism, as the United States can and does. But it does suggest that all member countries of the EU should put in place laws that designate Russia as a state sponsor of terrorism and therefore 
subject to further sanctions or punishment. Yeah, I mean, President Putin has been uh, reacting pretty defiantly to every single measure against his regime so far. We had that warning in the last few days from one of President Zelensky's advisers saying that um, Putin knew he was in a, in a dangerous position because the war was going so badly. I mean, do you think that that is just part of Ukraine's propaganda or is there some truth behind that? Well, it's hard to tell. I mean, clearly the war is going badly for Russia and clearly they're angry and upset and, and somewhat at a loss as to what to do. And I think these attacks on the civilian infrastructure are one of the responses. It's one of the things they feel they can do to hit back in response to that terrific defeat at Kherson, where they were forced to withdraw. But um, whether or not there is real unrest in Russia, it's very difficult to say. Clearly, an awful lot of people think that things have gone wrong and there's upset in the military at what are obvious humiliations and setbacks. How much this will either enrage or force Putin into some kind of concession is unclear. I think concessions are extremely unlikely at the moment. It'll probably make him more obstinate than ever to ramp up the pressure. Yeah, because we did have this word from President Zelensky saying that he had heard that President Putin wanted direct negotiations. And of course, um, Zelensky and the Ukrainian government have been very clear that they're not going to negotiate away parts of their uh, territory. But do you think there is a sense in which President Putin would like to have some form of negotiations, perhaps quite soon, with the um, very limited gains that he has made? Well, that would suit him in a way in that the war is costing Russia a lot, not least uh, the lives of very many young Russians. And that is beginning to have an effect on public opinion, uh, quite a severe effect. I mean, we don't know how angry uh, Russian ordinary people are, the, the body bags coming home. But one suspects, as we saw with Afghanistan, that it will in the end lead to some real serious anger uh, at what's going on. Uh, and so... I think Putin would like to find some way of simply declaring victory. I don't think he's ready to give back the territory he now holds. I think if there's ever going to be some kind of deal, it will not be a formal deal. It will just be uh, people stop fighting along where they, the boundaries that, where they are now. Uh, and it would have to be done by some kind of third party, possibly Turkey, uh, as nobody will trust Putin directly. I mean, I don't think we will ever see face-to-face uh, -face negotiations between Putin and Zelensky. But it's possible that in the next few months, the pressure will grow and we'll just have to see what happens. Um, there was, uh, have also been um, sporadic questions about Putin's health. Uh, I saw that uh, once again today, uh, some commentators had noticed that uh, he appeared uh, somewhat shaky during a, a meeting with Cuba's leader, one of the few world leaders that are still going to meet um, President Putin. Um, it, it's clearly very, very difficult indeed to get to the truth of what's happening there inside the Kremlin. But do you think that there is um, any sense in which these continuing rumours about Putin's health, that there could be something behind this? Or is that something which uh, his opponents are just keen to uh, continue to keep in the public mind? Very difficult to say. I mean, it could be wishful thinking. It's certainly clear that Putin doesn't seem to be uh, as fit and well as he was. He's He's been very paranoid over the threat from uh, COVID. And we saw this famous long table and, you know, he's isolated himself for almost two years and all that sort of thing. And there's rumours that he's taking steroids, which is making him very puffy. And people are then speculating, well, what is he taking the steroids for? Could it be cancer? Could it be some kind of blood disorder, whatever it is. I mean, there are various reasons why steroids might be prescribed, but uh, it could be just wishful thinking. On the other hand, if there is some kind of health problem, it could be extremely convenient if there is an attempt to get rid of him. Uh, he clearly won't just, just leave, but if the pressure is very strong, there could be a face-saving way out of saying he is uh, retiring on health grounds, which is uh, something where you know he, he goes out with some kind of dignity. Uh, but we'll just have to see how much pressure there is internally on him. Michael Binion, um, former foreign and diplomatic correspondent for The Times, uh, really good to speak to you. Thank you very much indeed.